You saw President Biden joined on stage there by Vice President Harris. Uh, you could clear her, see her clearly saying to him, I love you, Joe. But it was a remarkable speech. The president came on stage without a dry eye in the House, including his own and Vice President Harris and Tim Walz, uh, his, his daughter Ashley introducing him, um, and then just a sustained, extended ovation. Lawrence. You know, uh, it, it left me thinking about the lineage of what is now the 21st century Democratic Party. What we saw tonight began with a decision made by John Kerry to choose Barack Obama as the keynote speaker in 2004. Mm -hmm. What turns out to be a losing presidential campaign produces the next Democratic nominee, Barack Obama. That was the first time most of us saw Barack Obama speak. He was not yet a United States senator, as you mentioned. It was in the middle of his Senate campaign. And I remember saying on TV that night, we'd just seen the first black president. I don't know what the schedule is, but that's who it's going to be. And, and, and then Barack Obama chooses Joe Biden and chooses Joe Biden because Joe Biden ran against him. It was important for him to see Joe Biden at the presidential level of competition in the primaries to say, this is who I want, in addition to his experience of Joe Biden in the Senate. Joe Biden then comes along uh, and gets the nomination uh, on a staggered basis in the, in the electoral calendar. And he chooses Kamala Harris. And this all begins with that John Kerry choice. And, you know, I, I interviewed uh, President Biden in March of the campaign last time when it was it was locked up and the question was who is he going to pick for VP and that was one of the things we talked about and the, what I asked him was strongly suspecting that it was Kamala Harris is it important to you that your vice presidential nominee has experience in presidential campaigning and he said yes that's a factor hmm. right and of course it was a factor for for Barack Obama and so Kamala Harris knows that she would be the senior senator from New York tonight, out there clapping for someone else. Yeah. Uh, were it not for that decision that Joe Biden made, that was made in, in both the heat and the proving grounds of a presidential primary campaign. Uh, but what, what you see in this discussion we've had earlier about the talent that we see on the stage, mm -hmm. all these people we've seen on the stage, we never saw anyone take a convention stage, including tonight, we've never seen anyone take a convention stage the way Barack Obama took a convention stage in Boston in 2004. And so the talent we saw, we've been seeing and will see this week, tonight, you just have to ask yourself, who's the Obama? Who's the, who, who is it who we're going to see? But what you can be sure of is you will be seeing these people. Yeah. Uh, and, and that the decisions made just in terms of who speaks at these things defines our politics in ways that are completely surprising and, and un, you know, unpredictable. Uh, but if you just start with John Kerry's decision and on, on, on Barack Obama being the keynote speaker to where we are tonight, you see this handoff. You see this handoff, John Kerry, Barack Obama, Barack Obama to Joe Biden, Joe Biden to Kamala Harris, and here we are. You never know if the person to whom you are handing off is going to be able to run with it in the way they it can. But you are giving the them their enormity chance. of the yeah. decision. Yeah, the the exactly enormity right. of these decisions of who are you choosing as vice president, and we've just seen it be, be, become so enormous in the biggest possible way in in the choice Barack Obama made and in the choice Joe Biden made. And we also saw it in in the in the way that Joe Biden credited Vice President Harris with some of the accomplishments of their time governing, talking about her role in the, the hostage negotiations, for example. I mean, it's very specific and important stuff that they've shared in governing. Sure. Well, he said in sort of that tongue-in-cheek way, you know, some of the best presidents started as a vice president, yeah. obviously a nod to himself, but also it speaks about his legacy. Remember, Joe Biden was vice president when we were coming out of the financial crisis. He knows you have to take big action to solve big problems. He did that when he became president. We were coming out of COVID. He's now passing the torch, not just to VP Harris, but to all those speakers we saw tonight. Raphael Warnock, Andy Bashir, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Jasmine Crockett, where you saw, here's the next generation of Democratic leadership. And it was invigorating. Yeah. Jen. 
You know, watching that, I, there's a lot he's accomplished. He went through a lot of it in that speech, and we'll hear more of it over the next couple of months. But what struck me is when he talked about how character is destiny and progress is possible. And when people remember him, they will, yes, remember that the price of insulin has been capped and what he did for the climate crisis, but they will remember his character mm -hmm. and who he is as a human being. And I think you saw that in the speech, how he talked about Kamala Harris, how he ended the speech, how his family embraced him. Um, and that, that's what really struck me sitting there and watching it and just remembering what a deeply, deeply good human and how connected he is. And I also was thinking how hard that must have been for him to do. Yeah. Um, and how hard that was for Dr. Biden to do and how hard that was for Ashley Biden to do. You think about like when somebody wrongs, like if somebody wronged Susan, you know, <laughs> Don't even. If, somebody, <laughs> if somebody wrongs somebody you deeply love. And then you have to go out in the country and say, it's OK. Yeah, we're it's okay. for the best. It's yeah. for the best. We're standing up for democracy. And just the challenge of that, it, it really speaks to their character. And I think that's a big part of what the, the sacrifice of, writ large for the family. Yeah. yeah, and it was that in some ways is sort of form content, incredible pathos to the whole thing because of that, the self-sacrifice, uh, a man with a titanic ego. Let's be clear. Joe Biden, president of the United States, a formidable ego. The guy who ran for Senate, was elected in 29 years, has spent 50 years in public life. This is someone who um, occupies a room. He likes the attention on himself, like all of these things, and also paired with like a deep sense of service and fundamentally contrasted with a person who lives their entire life in service of ego and avoiding ego death in Donald Trump, even if that means bringing down the constitutional republic so as not to brook having lost. And here you have someone whose last major political act is this, this act of getting up there to say, like, vote for her. Yeah. Thank you, Kamala. Like, th that is, an, I mean, we've never said that. LBJ, as you said, was salty as all hell in 68 and basically wanted Nixon to win. You know what I mean? Like, what he did tonight, what Biden did tonight, is something never doesn't been happen in politics. Like, it's an incredible thing to watch it happen in real time and to know that, like, he is hitting the marks and doing all this in service of something higher than himself, in service of the country, in service of the Democratic Party, in service of American democracy. Like, that, that is walking the walk like I have rarely seen in my life covering politics. Can I just put a, a quick note on presidential and politician ego in perspective? Uh, <laughs> having worked with Joe Biden in the Senate, and Jen, I'm glad, to, happy to hear you on this, I would have ranked Joe Biden's ego in the 100 in the Senate that I worked in somewhere around 50. Yeah. Okay, so it's like he, he is, he is yeah. below average in actual fact and in the working day and the way ego intrudes on the working day, uh, which is very important, which is to say, how does the ego work when the door is closed and it's 12 people or six people or more trying to do something important? And he was never the problematic ego in the room. And there were definitely yeah. problematic egos in the room. Oh, I mean, it's definitely like senators, cable news hosts, presidents, <laughs> and we're all, we're all in there. None of it's good. But uh, the sacrifice, given that, given the price, the ego price of admission to have any Yes, exactly, job. to operate yeah, at this point. Let's, let's go to Chicago to our friends Joy and Alex, who are watching in the room. You guys. <laughs> Well, the ego has landed here in Chicago, <laughs> and it's wearing a green shirt, Rachel. Uh, I, can't. I can't hear you over the roaring of my voice in my own ears. Sorry. <laughs> um, I got to say, the, the noise when President Biden you took the it. stage, yeah. the 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 love in the room, the enthusiasm, the wistfulness, the, the, the just the crowd wanting to demonstrate to this man that he is beloved was not like anything. I've been to many conventions. It is not like anything I have ever seen in American politics to the rafters. We love you, Joe. It was deafening. Yeah, absolutely. You could feel it. It almost lifted uh, President Biden sort of off of the stage. I'll say that I don't have a comment about the speech. I, I would like to talk about what happened before and after the speech, because it's something that's so different than what we saw at the Republican National Convention. It starts with Ashley Biden bringing Joe Biden to tears. Yeah. 
And that embrace between the two of them, when he looks at her and dabs his eyes, so people were already at that point crying, yes. right? So we're, they were already set up for it. And then he gives this speech, and then afterwards, when you just saw the just raw affection that that family has for each other, the way they genuinely love each other, the way that his vice president, Kamala Harris, who he devoted some of his speech to, this is his moment. This was his night. This night was dedicated to Joe Biden, and parts of this night, including a biographical video, yeah. were given to Kamala Harris. This is not the way that the Hillary Clinton convention went, where she and Bernie Sanders seemed to be wrestling over the nomination to the very end. It's not the way the 88 convention went, when Jesse Jackson challenged Michael Dukakis for that convention, and it was bitter, and they had to make deals that changed the whole way the party gives out its delegates in order to appease, because they didn't want him on the ballot. They didn't want him on the ticket. They didn't yeah, want to or, give him that, and he wanted it. Yeah, or Carter Kennedy in 80. Carter Kennedy in 80. And so I don't think that, you know, as, as a nerdy kid who has watched conventions since I was in, you know, junior high school, I don't think you've ever seen a more seamless, more affectionate handoff of power from one person to another, both of whom have the aspiration to be president uh, and both of whom believe that they can occupy that seat. And they shared power in a, w in a great way. And the affection was just so palpable. Can I just say one thing about the speech itself as the lights come on and the and the, and the the frisky blue light is, is no longer? Um, and we look even cuter in this light, by <laughs> the, the way. The ego has landed. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say, you know, so much has been said, and I think rightly so, about the threat, that the fact that liberal democracy is under threat. Absolutely. And and it's not just Joe Biden's invocation of democracy being at stake. It's the way in which the power has been transferred. Yeah. It is a, a person saying it is better for not just the party, but for the country. Yeah. He believes for him to step off the ticket. It kind of it gives you faith that the American experiment mm -hmm. might not be over. A peaceful right? transfer of power within the within party, the party, where there could have been a convention fight. Think about that, guys. There could have literally been mm -hmm. a convention fight in this very space, and instead, it was the opposite. It was the absolute. It was opposite. the opposite remarkable. of the fight, and, uh, and that feels like pretty something pretty remarkable, indeed. You know what, I also wanted to put to you guys, just thank you for talking about that moment when he walked out there. We saw his daughter Ashley give those, we saw his, his wife Jill, the first lady, give those remarks. We saw his daughter Ashley give those remarks. By the time President Biden came on stage, as I said, there was not a dry eye in the House, including his own. Vice President Harris was, was welled up. Tim Walls was welled up. Uh, ev I mean, everybody that we saw. And then just that sustained emotional unending ovation that said, yeah. at first, we love Joe, we love Joe, we love Joe. And then it transitioned into, thank you, Joe, thank you, Joe, thank you, Joe. And that just uh, took the roof off like to, to yet another level. And he couldn't get anybody to stop saying it. I just feel like in America, in my 51 years of American life, I don't know of another big civic earnest, heartfelt, emotional expression of thanks, you know, that we yeah. congratulate yeah. one another. We have parades for heroes and we celebrate people's victories, but to celebration of, of thanks. Um, and, you know, we, we appreciate and love you for your civic virtue and for what you've done to our country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, since we've had, since we have had parades welcoming home people who have fought in war, and it has been generations since we have done that. I don't know anything else like that. Yeah, by the way, I clocked it, Rachel, at three minutes and 58 seconds. I've got it on my phone. The numbers are there. It was extremely lengthy. And, you know, and President Biden, he, he decided to kind of live in it. When Hillary Clinton was getting the same ovation, she was like, OK, stop. She was like trying to make it stop and she <laughs> right. couldn't make it stop. Yeah. But she also got the same kind of love tonight. Jesse Jackson got a sustained, appreciative response from this crowd. This is a crowd that came to celebrate its heroes and the heroes of democracy. And not just of the party. Let's be clear. This didn't feel like a partisan celebration. It felt like a celebration of the country. Uh, there was a lot of USA chants. Yeah, and, going and, on. and gratitude as, yeah. at its core, right? The idea of, you know, what, what you said, Rachel, this is civic service. Yeah. And, and the fact that these people have been servants shepherding the democracy forward, I think, is a, a really powerful theme for tonight. And Biden said he was grateful to the audience, but really it was just such a, 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 a palpable moment of public gratitude for someone who spent his life in politics. It yeah. was extraordinary.
Can I also just ask you guys, having been there in, in the room, we're all watching from here, and it's been a pretty emotional night, I would say, all together, of, of different kinds. I mean, Jasmine Crockett, the young congresswoman from Texas, who is um, so um, poised and so funny uh, and so edgy, and as she said in her speech tonight, she, she has gone viral very, very many times for her, <laughs> um, for her actions, you know, in, including in committee. Um, but there was actually a very poignant moment where I think it was made all the more poignant by her poise and by how, how in control she usually is and how clever she is when she teared up um, and talked about her first meeting with Vice President Harris um, and the empathy and kindness that Vice President Harris showed to her. We saw that. We saw three women uh, from Louisiana and, and, and Texas, and we, uh, three, three different women tell their personal stories about just incredible trial and incredible yeah. pain and loss because of the Trump abortion bans. Um, and then we saw this lead up into President Biden in which the waterworks just turned on everywhere. That's how it felt from here. When you guys were watching the sort of back half of the, of the program tonight and seeing how things are resonating in the room, what, what stood out to you guys? Oh, Hadley Duvall. For, we, mm -hmm. we both immediately started Googling and, uh, the, the, the whole story, a horrific story that Hadley Duvall told. And it is the nightmare. It's the great American nightmare. A young woman raped by her stepfather and presented with that, that you know, this world in which a young woman who's suffered that kind of trauma is then ordered by the state to give birth to her own stepfather's child is so horrific. And, and I think Alex and I were both just marveling at the, how poised and controlled she was. I couldn't have done it. She did it. Yeah. I thought she was a, and I, and there was a hush in the room. There was a sense of just awe of her in the room. And it really brought that issue of forced birth home. I, I, I think one of the things that's really struck me, Rachel, is, you know, the Republican National Convention was very homogenous. And the, the vibrancy of this of this convention, both in terms of generation, race, I mean, it, it just feels like the speakers are both holding up a mirror to the audience and the audience is holding up a mirror to the speakers. There's yeah. so much, as you point out, there's so much diversity of experience, but the, the, the audience itself is diverse. And so I think people really feel their struggles are being reflected by, by the party writ large and by the interlo and the people who are articulating the party platform. And so there's this very symbiotic relationship, I think, between the party public and the party elders that makes for like a, a real synchronicity, especially, you know, when these stories are emotional, women see themselves in these stories, yeah. men see themselves in these yeah. stories, um, the young and the old. And it's been, it's, it's a really powerful, I think, relationship yeah. between the people on stage and the people in the audience. Very Inclusive. And, and just for the record, Tim Walls, I think, has been crying all night. Every time I look over, Tim Walls is overwhelmed, which this totally makes sense. It does. It's overwhelming and, for all of us, and I would imagine it's especially overwhelming for Tim Walls. And can I tell you the thing that was refreshing? Not one negative sign. No signs that said mass deportation yes. now. It was kind of refreshing. Yeah. It was all we love Joe. It was, it's like a, a, a love fest here. It was and, like. Yeah, it was all this. That's all nice. Well, well, that's I why mean, we're just on. like People Christmas. People were definitely chanting. We decided to literally be Christmas like, for you. There, <laughs> there, there, there was several well, yeah. points yeah. out there was a lock him up moment during Hillary Clinton's speech. Yeah. No, where, with love. Lock him up with love. Yeah. Yeah. Lock him up this way. Yeah, yeah. 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 And Hillary Clinton did not. I mean, yeah, she didn't participate. Did not participate. She just kindly looked over them and waited for them to stop. Yes, but we do have to acknowledge that that was said. But we should just say, when we were talking about Hadley Duvall, it was maybe one of her last lines she delivered where she said, what is beautiful about a child being told you have to carry your parents' child? Yeah. I mean, a stunning statement. Her bravery, and people forget, she then introduced Andy Bashir. It was an her advertisement yeah. that, that she was in mm -hmm. just before the election when Andy Bashir won that race where, where, where he beat uh, the Mitch McConnell endorsed, Donald Trump endorsed opponent and beat him by five percentage points. So just extraordinary to see this woman share her story. And to Alex's point, it affects men, it affects women. You hear something like that, it, it affects all people. Yeah, to see that young woman talking about what she went through as a 12-year-old. Child. To see her introduce Andy Bashir, who then talks about his faith, to see Raphael Warnock, 
pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, then ripped the bark off in terms of his speech tonight to see Jamie Raskin on the constitutional affront that is Trump, and Trump has been specifically January 6th, to have Jasmine Crockett, to have AOC, to have Ashley Biden, mm. to have it summoned here. I mean, this is... Simone Sanders joins us again. Um, this was a... Uh, it did not feel like it was an I, the way I thought it was going to feel. I thought it was going to be sort of an on-ramp, a crescendo all night to the Biden speech. It was not that at all. This was a very emotional, very effective and affecting presentation for hours. Out, and it was necessary. I, uh, there are already people, and I'm just going to say they're complaining, that Joe Biden was on, not in... Pro Why was he not on before 9 I'm by sorry. 10 p.m.? 11 p.m. is an extraordinary time to be on television. Does the West Coast not matter? Great point. I mean, it was... It was <laughs> that is a great point. point. It was, it was, it was, it was late. late, but it was late because... They had a, it wasn't just any program. It was a, the, the, the people who were speaking, they had something to say. Mm. The, the Democratic Party apparatus was telling a story tonight, was demonstrating, as I've said, the depth and breadth of who they are, what they believe, setting the tone for this week, frankly, and for the rest of this election. What it is they have to do, the stakes here, how far they've come, how they got here. Mm. It takes, you gotta build the story. And then to see Joe Biden, Joe Biden has been in public service since he was in his mid-20s. Joe Biden knows what it's like to be a young person that has something to say, that wants to get engaged and get involved, um, that feels like the people in power don't, you know, haven't, haven't passed the baton to the yep. younger generation. That's what Joe Biden was when he got in. When he was 29 years old, he was elected to the United States Senate. His first wife and baby daughter had killed in a car accident, and he said he didn't want to serve. And it was the senators in the United States Senate at the time that pulled him in, Republicans and Democrats, hmm. that made sure that he would be okay and told, the, and told him that you need to be here. We need you. America needs you. The Senate needs you. The, America definitely needed Joe Biden. And to go from that 29-year-old young person to this seasoned president, who won an election at a time, who won a primary that everybody said he couldn't win, mm. who beat Donald Trump in an election where everyone said he was just in the basement and they didn't know how he was going to do it, and then became president of the United States, vaccinated America, cut bipartisan deals, and even the people who work for him, we were like, well, we don't know, sir, but we got, we going to do what you say do. We, I just don't know how he going to do it, but he got it done. And then to say, and I'm still not finished, I still want to run, the people say, no, you're not. Joe Biden says, yes, I am. And then he says, you know what? I need to do what's best for America. Mm. And then while everybody else was playing checkers, Joe Biden was playing chess and said, and mm -hmm. I'm passing the baton to my vice president, the person who has been loyal to not just me, but America throughout this entire process. The person who I said is the representative yep. of what the future of this party is. That's Joe Biden. So if he wanted to speak for 25 more minutes now, I would have been like, I want to go to sleep now, Rachel. I'm going to kiss Rachel from, from my hotel room. But he deserved this night and yeah. so much more. It was a privilege of my life to work for Joe Biden. Mm. And America, that's a great American president. I'm not going to top that. We have much more of our special coverage of night one of the DNC ahead here. There, yeah, boy, this is going to be a week. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. What will our children say? Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America, I gave my best to you.